been through a uh, major hurricane or anything like that. I am a little jaded since I went through Andrew and survived it, so uh, anything three or above, I just say see ya. And I'll come back to stuff later. So in this case, my see ya is in Seattle. But the uh, first class was such a little room for error for missing a lecture. You know, if we can squeeze an hour in, I think that would benefit for you. Then we'll get you guys underway and you know, everyone be safe and we'll reconvene next week. Okay. Because um, what's next Thursday? Thursday. Yes. 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 If we have power, right? Uh, yes. Messes everything up, then we'll, uh, we'll reschedule. Okay. Just give him back another week if that's what's needed. You know, like Andrew with six weeks of no power. Yeah, we'll do that. We'll just we'll see what happens. Okay. Over okay. Yeah. So but before time gets away from us, uh, why don't you guys machine. go ahead and open the quiz. Bonus this week: no essay questions. You fill in the blank. Thank you. All right. I'm trying to stress you out. Everything's for the reading. <laughs> And you get 12 minutes, it's like 10 minutes extra generous. If you don't mind when you're done, just pick up the book. Oh, hold on. I, I got it. You got it? Yeah. Should be in the modules in section one. No, it's done. Okay.
Thank you, everybody. Anybody not done? Okay. So, I still give you credit. I'm sorry. It's an impossible permutation. Is it? I'm not, I'm not all knowing at all. So, uh, do you always make it so you can't go back and re uh, yes. review? Yes. Yes. So the, the, two, the two principles that you guys have to kind of keep in mind. This is just this why it's low risk, right? Please. So who cares? Right? As long as you get close, that's fine. But here's the other thing that comes in, into play. On the real board exam, you are timed. So you gotta you have to make a decision like nope, it's nowhere in there. Go. Because you could spend that minute and a half really kind of ruminating on something that's gonna be more complex. Like you ask any questions on this one. But you don't get a minute and you get like ten minutes to answer those, and that should be that should be fun. Uh, if you were close or in the same vein, I'll give you partial credit for it. It's fine. Come on. Yeah. If you were like, you're going to get some notes started with the letter. <laughs> I'll see which letter that was, and we'll go. I'll see which letter that was, and we'll go from there. Okay? So I, I'll go over it. If you see what there's people, a lot of people ask me if I put this and this instead of yes. pin in yes. diameter. Even though that clearly says yeah. index safety. <laughs> 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 I'll still give credit to them. And then number two. Uh, yeah, the true false one about uh, barometric pressure is just not affected by these things keys, right? Yeah. Um, it's true. Yeah, it's, 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 it's not affected. Not affected by very much pressure. It's true. It's not affected. Not affected by very much pressure. It's but the actual statement. So if Mark David put false, if Mark David is wrong. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. That's a mistake. Oh, so I'll just say. Okay. Okay. Well, okay. Well, okay. Well, okay. Well, okay. All right. Yeah. So that's an important thing to remember, right? When you're doing all these calculations, who cares? Like the the physical pressure never changes except by temperature. Temperature can change, but not very much of pressure. Uh, very much of pressure is used in the formula to do carrier gas output stuff, but I told you on your exams, I'm never going to ask you to calculate the flow needed to produce said vaporizer output on a copper kettle or a flow measured vaporizer. If you would like to learn how to do that for the zombie apocalypse, or if an EMP gets detonated and all the electronic stuff goes bye bye, and then we go to the museum to get vaporizers out to be able to administer anesthesia and knock yourself out, I would be happy to have some math parties with you guys so we could, you know, really get crazy with that. What's that calculation? The calculations. The variable bypass vaporizer ratios. Do yeah, we need to know ratios. how to calculate that? Yeah. Ah. You need to know what they are, like conceptually you know what they are, but I'm not going to give you a math problem. So we don't have to memorize 25 to 1 and... Why would you do that? Well, because I already have. That's a third. Why would you do that? Well, because I already have. That's a third. That's good enough. That you're amazing. I don't know about that. Okay, so let's move on so we can get you guys out of here in a timely manner, okay? Um, you guys give me some feedback as far as like, so we open the module, I, I try to make a reading assignment doable for like a three week period. So we open the module, I, I try to make a reading assignment doable for like a three week period of time. Okay, I think it's fair. Um, and then the, as far as the material that's covered, right, we try to use lecture to kind of help elucidate some of the more complex concepts. I think that augmented with the lab, hopefully the idea was, ah, this is a machine, here's this stuff, you know, machine, here's this stuff, you know. I can flip the switch. Woo. Right. Most of you got to breathe into a mask and learn. This is not what don't ever leave the EPL on. This is what it feels like. Those are the kind of important takeaways that I wanted you to be able to experience during lab. Now that you had that and you went back to going to doing your reading, is there anything in particular? So the options are I can read and review the part of the research, which will be divided into low, intermediate, and high pressure systems for pneumatic stuff. I can go over vaporizers, which yeah. The concept is pretty easy. I think you should be able to get it. Mm -hmm. Or we can do uh, the low flow finder, which I told you to wait, uh, or the, the ventilator, like doing ventilator settings and what they mean on getting pointed at. Sorry, how do you have a ventilator? What? Be nice. <laughs> <laughs> remember, and that's the important part about having the quiz. So if you'll notice in the feedback, all of the questions that came from your quiz came directly. And I try to pick things that are at least in, big surprise, key points. If you don't know the key points, well then you missed the point of the chapter, right? And then the key points should guide you into learning at the surface level and deeper into some of the other sections. 
And I know full well it's not possible for you to memorize every single sentence inside of a chapter, paragraph of each major section, is it not? So, I mean, if I were you, if I was given the task of doing it, I'd focus on those things first. If there's any room left in my brain, I'll dive a little deeper. Okay? But the main, like, don't waste an hour and a half or two hours reading through a chapter and get to the end like that. Sorry. Days. Let's be honest. Okay. So, I mean, if I were in your position and you gave me a new topic I've never seen before, I'd focus on the main headers first to make sure I got those. Right? So that after I close the book, I had like the concepts, period, like a couple of ideas, great. Then after I've got that locked away, go back, look at it again, say, like, yes, I've seen this again before, dive a little deeper. Right? As soon as you start to like get fuzzy and get lost, skip. Go on to the next one. Right? And just you have to circle it back again. This is the same thing you're gonna have to do when you do it. And guess what? You have to know it all. So you start going the first like ten pages, you're like, oh yeah, I got it. And then it just gets fuzzy. Start over again. Okay? So I know it's hard. Uh, and I'm trying to be fair, like there's a lot to know, I get it. But um, my expectation, I don't want to be unrealistic either. Okay. Right? Like on the pre anesthesia safety checklist. Item do you know the first thing, like according to the official checklist, you should have yes, I should have an auto inflating, like an ambu bag. It even says it in the question. Right? It has to be self-inflated. It goes on about that. You can't have a Mapleson circuit. Because a Mapleton self-inflated. It goes on about that. You can't have a Mapleson circuit. Because a Mapleton circuit requires fast forward O2 flow. And what if you don't have the wrench to open the O2 cylinder? Or you have no regulator? Well then you're kind of sweeping and give air. Done. Okay, so that's why that was a, that was a kind of like a takeaway from it. Um, okay, so that's why that was a, that was a kind of like a takeaway from it. Um, all right. So let's talk about then. You said you wanted ventilator. Is that in the chapter? As you wish. I think that sentence are in the chapter. It's not. I think that sentence are in the chapter. It's not a chapter, but we have a PowerPoint. Right, but I mean, like, I didn't read about it. Do you want parts of the ventilator? Do you want how, like, ventilator modes and how to set them? Modes and how to set them. Because I don't think that's in our chapter. It's not. Okay. Talking about ventilator. I have a... a Was well, it on the test? Oh, yeah. um, some of us were talking about, like, circle breathing uh -huh. and the different components, the direction of flow. Mm -hmm. That gives a, like a broad sense of the way. Yeah. So that'd be like in the anesthesia machine. Right? Yes. Yeah. So I think that like you want. may be curious about it now. Well then skip oh, it. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Give us the information we need to know. Not in the readings. <laughs> okay. Oh, that's in the okay. Well, you have given us the PowerPoint. I think that's why we're confused. Right. So well, the ventilator parts, yes. yes. Right. Like what are the bellows, mm -hmm. inspiratory valves, expiratory valves, right? That's Dry right. gas on top. Like those things are in, oh. in the test, right? But so itself, I think that's an advancing, and until you've been in the OR, oh. it's, a, it's a concept that I think we should, like if I have to choose what to cut, I'm going to cut that. Because you're not going to, you need to know that later. And so you're going to cut low flow then too, you said, since we haven't gone over it? Yeah, I'll, I want to talk about the concept of what that means, but again, until you're in the OR and you've seen, like how, I'll talk about the concept of what that means, but again, until you're in the OR and you've seen, like how an anesthetic proceeds and, you know, you've experienced it a few times, I think it would be lost on you. Mm -hmm. but still, I need to give it to you. You tuck it away for later, and then we're going to come back and revisit it. Probably like later in the semester when you've actually done some observation bits. Probably like later in the semester when you've actually done some observation bits. I think it's more valuable. Yes? So you're saying the components of the breathing circuits will be on the test? Yeah. 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 Right. Uh, in, yeah. In. Why? Anatomy of the yeah. anesthesia machine PowerPoint, and then the probably the medical right. gas pipeline right. anesthesia. And, 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 and remember, PowerPoint are to help augment mm -hmm. and supplement mm -hmm. this in the reading. Mm -hmm. You were to spend lots of time memorizing PowerPoints, mm -hmm. I'd say skip that. Memorize lots of stuff in readings. If you have a hard time understanding that, go to the PowerPoints and say, all right, what was the value about that? What's the picture look like? Well, then Miller's got tons of good pictures too. Let's stop it. Can you help me figure this out? Then we have a conversation. Can she clear it up? Then you move on. All right, that's at least the ideal way. So, 
over the hurricane when we're all scattered. Can we email you personal questions? Uh, yes, I, it will be easier for me. The conference is insanely busy. Okay. So the talk. Okay. Because uh, I don't want to be like walking down the street, like you know, giving like, you know right. half-assed answer to whatever. I want to understand what you really answer. Okay. Okay. Over. Thank you. Do you use the little chat thing on um, Canvas? Yeah. Well, it'll get to me. I get an email. Like, that's a good way to get my attention because it'll come in multiple ways. It'll come in multiple ways. But, you know, honestly, no, just because like, that's a way for you to like, talk to multiple people at once. Not the sessions. No, 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 no. Yeah, it's fine. Uh, if you don't get a response from me, then just email me. If you don't get a response from me, then just email me or text me, and then I'll, I'll get back to you. All right, what are we going to do? Fights. Not that fights. Anatomy of the narrow later. And anatomy of the institution. Okay. Okay. stuff and go to the stuff that you guys are, uh, I want to kind of tailor it to what most people are, are wondering about. Uh, this is a lecture I adapted from uh, the, like the father of anesthesia technology, he's a blueberry farmer now, he's retired, but the, like the father of anesthesia technology, he's a blueberry farmer now, he's retired, but Jerry Dorsch and his wife Susan Dorsch who wrote, they are the Dorsch and Dorsch of the Dorsch and Dorsch book. Uh, he had a career at BAM and he's kind of the first guy to write a you know a Bible of anesthesia technology. He, he always liked this picture because it was like if anything reminded him of anesthesia technology. He, he always liked this picture because it was like if anything reminded him of being in the operating room for a lifetime, it was you know Antarctica. But we don't use Dorsch anymore. No, we don't. We're not tested on. We're not tested again. PowerPoints are merely here to supplement like your understanding of yeah, conceptual stuff, right? Here we go. Old, old school, man, just be thankful. You don't have to do this stuff anymore. Okay? And look, in a decade, all they evolved to was from this to that. Okay, we've got three cylinders on that, great. Now, observe, from 70 to 80, nothing much changed except for color. Right? <laughs> now we got some. Uh, when I went to Honduras, believe it or not, they had three of these. They were not going two Bs, not the two Cs. They have one extra knob on it that flexes for your flow pressure, um, which you have no idea. Like, it's always, it was comical to me. I was like, what is this? I'm like, well, it affects how fast, like, what our modern anesthesia care stations, like, it's all been compacted into this, like, nice little monitor, and everything is, that we need is inside it. But before, it was all disparate types of uh, 
This is equipment and technology. None of it was interconnected. You had lots of on-off switches, lots of tubes that could fail. I mean, this was your, your life. Um, the, the drawers in the bottom, it was discounted price. Lead um, blocks that you could put in the bottom drawer to lower the center of gravity to make it less likely to tip over. How about that? Now, this was the epitome of modern uh, institution late nineties, early day of modern uh, institution late nineties, early uh, two thousand. The ADU is dis discontinued them. It was the first anesthesia machine made by Daytech Sumitas before GE, um, and it it was the first one to have its own EMR anesthesia charting system in it. But you had to use their keyboard EMR anesthesia charting system in it. But you had to use their keyboard, which was one of the first waterproof keyboards that you could kind of wipe down if they cared about, you know, being, you know, uh, clean and being able to wipe down and put to the side of the hex and all that other stuff. And the keys were so hard to depress, you could only chicken peck it. Right? So this is a major barrier to people adopting it. Uh, thank goodness things have evolved now. Well, here's a, this is a Draeger Apollo. So just different screens, evolution of the anesthesia machine. So there's two different parts, electronic and pneumatic, right? The electronic system is the electro electri electricity, right? So even the pneumatic uh, power that would power the ventilator, supplies electricity, all that other stuff. So um, that means it had to have safety things like a power failure indicator, it had to have backup power. And uh, I don't know if you guys know this, but um, we, in general, all have phones that have rechargeable batteries. And you may or may not know this, but the commonly used left and everything have a finite amount of times that it can be charged. And do you know how many that is? It's just by design. About 360 charges. And then after 360 full charge cycles, all the way up and all the way down, the, the highest amount of capacity, duration of use, will only be at best, of use will only be at best 80%. And then after the next 100, it goes down to 60%. And then you wonder, why am I always going to get charge in all the time? Well, so the electronic machines that we have now also have battery backups, but they largely go unmonitored. They just leave them plugged in all the time. And that's why when largely go unmonitored, they just leave them plugged in all the time. And that's why when you have an older machine, you should really do the full, like pull the plug out of the wall and see what happens. Right? And then you get an idea of like immediate failure, which is very common on the older machines, because the, the biomed does not actually check that very well. They just kind of put a, a device onto it, not actually check that very well. They just kind of put a, a device onto it, they plug it in, it says, green light, okay, go, right? Thank you for the check. And then when it actually fails under duress, you've got a real problem. Okay, so backup power is important, but that was really what was nice about pneumatically driven machines. No big deal. Lights may go out, right? I'll pull out my, my you know, spelunking light, get it through the machine. It was sufficient to carry a volatile agent oxygen and you could use your hand to find the, the grippy rubber bag hanging from the, the arm there and you could squeeze that and then you could deliver oxygen and you could deliver a breath. You could detect respirations, all that other stuff came in the dark. Um, uh, functions of the anesthesia machine. Okay. Da, 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 da. That is the master switch. So remember how we talked about that the O means you know, no power, the I does not mean intermittent. It means the circuit is complete. So we'll be in the on position, right? In the ADU, that fully electronic machine, that's that. Let me memorize that and go forward here. Um, the <laughs> when uh, like catastrophic failures on our electronic machines happen, that's usually what you get for a few seconds before everything goes, goes downhill. Okay? So uh, on most groups that came through our lab, we, we practiced going to the alternate mode of ventilation, which is in our lab. We, we practiced going to the alternate mode of ventilation, which is a completely separate, pneumatically driven oxygen flow. Okay? Um, these are always fun to see. This is on a Draeger type machine. Things are going poorly. You see this on your screen. Okay? So we'll just go to the end. Look at that battery. That's a lead. Okay? So we'll just go to the end. Look at that. that battery. That's a lead acid battery in there. Basically, a car battery wrapped in plastic. Okay, it can go for hours, which is good. Right? It's only good for three years. That replace them all. Um, important note about this: I think we talked about it with some groups, but these power outlets are good for plugging things into some groups. But these power outlets are good for plugging things into that are of low amperage draw. So who can tell me? 
what are some normal everyday life devices that are low amperage draw and what are high amperage draw? What, do you what, do you like? what? A light. A light like a lamp. lamp. What? Do you like? what? A, light. a light like a lamp. lamp. Yes, it's possible, depending on the wattage. Could be low, especially with an LED bulb. Is an iPhone charger low amperage? Uh, say again? Is an iPhone charger low amperage? How can you tell? Um, stick on, the on the back of the actual plug, it says the amp. Stick on, the on the back of the actual plug, it says the amp. How many amps? Typically. Isn't it? Two for an iPad. Like one. Per Very good. Very nerdy right there. <laughs> Microsoft, it's two amps for a, like a tablet type device. Look on your uh, your power chargers that you have for your laptops. How many amps is that? You wonder how I like, gather so many meaningless pieces of information in my head. This might be on the test. This will not be on the test. It's just you know how to learn. There's a point to it. There's input and output voltage, but what's the amps? Apples makes them almost microscopic. I wanted to read. It's simply around one, two, one, two minutes. So I want you to look here. On the back of the machine, when you ask yourself, should I plug this in here? Do you see what this says? Two times five amps. So you can plug two of these in, but it can only add up to five amps. Do you know what has more than three amps in your household, typically? Keurig. What? A TV. A TV, probably. Well, if it's an LED TV, probably not. But an old-fashioned TV, yes, definitely did. How about uh, a refrigerator, air conditioners? Yeah, pop, right, those are high amperage. A dryer, high amperage. A dryer, high amperage. Air dryer, very high amperage. So, do we have a device in the operating room that mimics what a hair dryer is? A bear, a bear. Is it bear? A forced air warming device it uses heating coils to help force air, uh, warm air. That would be an example of a high amperage device. You would never plug air, uh, warm air. That would be an example of a high amperage device. You would never plug that in here. We have a very interesting time, about five seconds after you turn that thing off. Okay? Good times. My preceptor, when I was in school, when I went to a new place at Shambles, that was what he needed me. And you walked out of the room, place at Shambles, that was what he needed me. And you walked out of the room, the whole thing went dark. And he's just sitting out there, not outside the window looking, far away from the window, about 10 feet. I couldn't see him, but he could see me. And just like sitting there, like, just waiting, like, what's he gonna do? Okay, I remember that. And then the bag collapsed because it didn't turn the EPL valve on. Okay. Everything okay up there? I'm like, uh, uh, I don't do that to you guys. I will not, not do that to you guys. But that's the example, right? So they put the amperage limits on there so that you don't plug things in that exceed it so it doesn't trip the breaker. The same thing happens. Uh, these parts of electronics, so in, in the olden days, they had lots of serial ports to be able to do that. So. We looked at, as part of our anesthesia machine check, did we not? Mm -hmm. Those little dongles that come off the back of the anesthesia machine, the physiologic monitor that we had an ED1000 in our room, and those all went into that magic box that did that combined all those data. Okay, and they get converted into Ethernet. The pneumatic system is totally different, right? It was primarily the high, intermediate, and low pressure system. On anything but the machine we did our lab on, the old school machines like that blue Drager Narcomed 2C, um, that's clearly divided into a high, intermediate, and low pressure system. Like if I put a diagram that happens to be in your reading, it has clearly all of the parts on it, and I put like you know, put a piece of paper over it. Do you know what that is? That's how you know whether you know the material or not. Okay? It may show up in that format. Or I may ask you, choose from the following very long list the parts that are the platform of most of the older anesthesia machines, all those uh, two things are there. Okay? In the high pressure system, you guys got to see all the cylinders on the back of the machine. The yokes, you guys know what a yoke is? Now, you've seen the yoke, right? And the pressure regulator, you can't see that, but you, I told you it's behind it, it's in there. Right behind the, the metal part of the yoke. Oxygen cylinder outside the hospital that you drive by to come in the back way that's covered with ice is a high pressure system. And it is high pressure until it passes this thing called the downstage regulator, which is basically a device 
that is restricted in size, like the, the opening is restricted so that the high pressure is restricted in size, like the, the opening is restricted so that the high pressure gas gets down regulated to an intermediate pressure. So you should know the difference in numbers in PSIG between high pressure and intermediate pressure and low pressure. Okay? But at low pressure. Okay? But cylinder, gas color codes. Now, realize that these are different in the United States and in Europe. I don't ask you European questions. We're practicing in the United States. Okay? Yoke block, in case you missed it. You guys saw all that. Yoke block, in case you missed it. You guys saw all that. We, we, we didn't take one off. But we'll do that on another lab. But we did show you the, the pin index safety system and the diameter index safety system. I know that, like, I saw the, the quiz today, we said, all right, so mainly pipeline is supposed to be this. But the quiz today, we said, all right, so mainly pipeline is supposed to be this. Traditionally, the pin index safety system is for the cylinders. But I showed you at the hospital how the pipeline, even there, used like a combo of uh, his and this together, mm -hmm. okay? But traditionally, if somebody asks you a kind of board question, which is for which, yeah, mm -hmm. okay? But traditionally, if somebody asks you a kind of board question, which is for which, you would say this is for pipeline, this is for cylinders. Okay? Um, I will not ask you a question on what is the position for oxygen and for air and for nitrous. You do need to know that for your board type question. Like for your boards, that's something they would ask you. Um, no so I thought that I saw some conflicting information. Is this the right? Is is this the right configuration for that, one through seven? That's all. Seven? That's all. That's all no, I know. I. <laughs> uh, right. We talked about having. Um, we did all of our machine checks in the lab, and I showed you that it's important to look at the, both the cylinder pressure gauge, which is digital on the ACES, but on old school machines, you'll have two sets of gauges: one for the uh, cylinders and one for the. Um, the pipeline for uh, when you're done checking the high pressure system. Do we leave the, uh, the cylinder open so we can constantly measure it? No. no. So we have to close the cylinder and then bleed the system out so it goes back down to zero. Okay. And I will not ask you to explain in an essay question why. I ask you to explain in an essay question why we have to do that. But what we talked about is that in this picture here, what you see, that, that's a board on pressure gauge. There's a thin little, you know, hardened pipe that's into the pipeline, and that pressure under high pressure is pushing this circular, circular little spring, and that's attached to that orange, is pushing this circular, circular little spring, and that's attached to that orange little needle there, and it's been calibrated so that when it's at 2,000 psi, it points to 2,000, and then when it, as it bleeds off, it will pull back at a, at a graduated rate so that when there's no pressure left, it will be at zero. Okay, and because it's metal and it can fatigue rate so that when there's no pressure left, it'll be at zero. Okay, and because it's metal and it can fatigue, we don't want to leave it at 2,000 all the time because over years, it may fatigue and then when the pressure goes away, guess what? It will stay. I mean, you'll think you'll have 2,000 PSI, but in fact, you have 20. Okay? It can be intermediate pressure, I guess you guys said we should have parts of that there. The pneumatic switch. It's a physical switch, and I think in almost every group, I tried to, whoever had the uh, the magic, you know, uh, flip of the switch, I had you go back and forth when you're doing machine check. And we talked about why it very easily, just with like the brain design, can go to the ventilator, but you have to forcibly, right, pragmatically go back to the bag. And why is that? Because when you, we typically, we're anesthetists. We put patients in a state of almost death, Right? We give them near lethal doses of hypnotics and opioids, and then sometimes a chemical. Uh, they cannot breathe on their own. So it is safer to default to a state of mechanical ventilation than to come off of it, um, especially when it's for that purpose. Okay. So you do not have to memorize the anatomy of like springs and all this other stuff. I don't want you to. Leave. Don't get crazy. Okay? Heart springs and all this other stuff. I don't want you to. Leave. Don't get crazy. Okay, hard seals, but it's a pipeline inlets. Did somebody already do that? Uh huh. Hey, you know, more knowledge is not necessarily bad. I'm just, 
Just like so there's another example of both the, the oxygen uh, pressure for both the pipeline and the cylinder. Both the, the oxygen uh, pressure for both the pipeline and the cylinder. Okay, we talked about testing the proper activation and deactivation of the oxygen failure protection device. Right? And there's a number of different implements in a machine that represent that. It's not just one thing. It's just a type of safety system. Okay, the one that we talked about. Okay, the one that we talked about on the electronic machine is that if you were to disconnect the pipeline, you get an audible and visible alert. It's different than anything else. It gets your attention. It says, hey, 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 we got no more pipeline. JDA came and did their construction, and I know we clearly marked where the pipeline was, but they dug through it anyways. And so you know to go and, okay, and then when you open the tank up, you now have an oxygen supply, so it should say, okay, we're good. Right, and then we did it in reverse. We closed the tank, bled the system down to zero, it reactivates again, and we then rescue it by plugging back into the pipeline. So that's the sequence. Unplug pipeline, wait till the alarm turns on. Open the cylinder. Okay, and then we're gonna close the cylinder and activate the alarm again, which bleeds down the pressure back down to zero, which is our desire. And then we plug back the pipeline, and now we're back into the standard state of the machine. Okay? Uh, so that's the supply failure alarm, and then the oxygen failure safety device is uh, Actual audible alarm. Now on the older machines, like an machines, like an ARPAMED or an XL210, it's a pneumatic horn. It sounds like a, a dying animal. It's unmistakable. But it only lasts for about 10 seconds until all of the pressure is gone. And it goes, and that's all you get. Did you ever hear that? And that's all you get. Did you ever hear that? You gotta, you know, ears perk up. Let's do some troubleshooting and make, you know that the oxygen supply just got cut for whatever reason, okay? Um, you can see a diagram of that there. Lights, fun stuff. See a diagram of that there. Lights, fun stuff, right? We talked about where is the line of demarcation for transitioning from the intermediate pressure system to the low pressure system. Right, distal, right, not at it. Distal to the flow meter needle valve, right? So, a pixel of accuracy. <laughs> where is, where does the low pressure system start if you're one pixel off the mark you're one? No, but you need to know that it's distal to the flow meter needle valve on a board type question. That is typically how they ask it. Okay. Uh, where do you read the flows? You read, you read from the center. Okay, if you read through, if you guys look at my, my old school YouTube video, what did I say? Before you turn an old school machine on, what's the one thing you have to check on the flow meters? Turn the Make sure they're all the way off, because if some idiot left it at full, which it, it's a possibility, because think about the end of the day, when you're in a biz against eight, but you really don't wake up any faster, so why do people do that? They're, they're massaging themselves, not, not actually helping the patient, okay? But in a hurry, Right, let's say you pull the tube out, all right, get over the bed, and we can get out of here. And what do you do with the machine? You plugged in 15 liters all weekend long. Right, and then somebody comes by, the, the, the tech, right, and then somebody comes by, the, the, the tech comes by and just shuts everything off. They forget to turn the four liters down. And you come in on Monday, fresh at, what do we say? 3.30 a.m.? We, we, right. <laughs> and in your enthusiasm, you go to turn it on, and those bobbins float through Thomas go, right? And it's especially bad if it's got the flow through Thomas go, right? And it's especially bad if it's got the twin flow meters. Like you can actually dial in to within 10 mLs per minute. Right? You can get 50 or 60 mLs per minute of oxygen. Crazy. That little microscopic thing is the most delicate of all. And that will also rocket microscopic thing is the most delicate of all. And that will also rocket into the stratosphere uh, <laughs> just like the other float or bottle, okay? So I think like my major thing when I watch someone go to do a safety check on a machine, especially if it's an old one, so I watch to see what they will do before they reach for the main power switch. Because you should be reaching for the clockwise, that's right, all the way down, okay? Um, notice how the, the safety design statement in the dark, could you tell that there's a difference between the oxygen and the nitrous, right? Yeah. One has like a sprockety feel and one is kind of like a, you know, Rough file system in the data media world, they called it the link 25 system. So there's a chain, I showed you the picture last time they were watching, where they're, they're linked together with a physical chain. 
So if you turn the nitrous on first, it will pull the oxygen up and keep it in a 70-30 configuration. Or 75-30. Okay? And then main manufacturer, there's a, like a tote. It's pressure driven. And there's like a little ball valve that goes in between, behind the oxygen and the nitrous oxide. So if you were to turn the nitrous oxide up first, nothing would happen. It's different than the Datex Amita. So on the Datex Amita ones, you can turn the nitrous on and it pulls the oxygen up. Amita. So on the Datex Amita ones, you can turn the nitrous on and it pulls the oxygen up. The Drager, you can spin the nitrous all day, nothing will happen. But as soon as you touch the oxygen, then it will rise to meet the 70 30 mixture. And I think that's a key difference between the, the two main manufacturers. Okay, so you can never give 100% nitrous oxide being manufacturers. Okay, so you can never give 100% nitrous oxide because it will not work until you open the oxygen uh, flow meter. The moment you touch the oxygen flow meter, it will give as much nitrous as allowable, 70% is the maximum, or 75%. Hi. Okay? Digital, or 75%. Hi. Okay? Digital large, let's get past this. On the ADU, which you guys will not use, that was their selector valve. You could only use air and nitrous, or, uh, sorry, air or nitrous. And the ACES machine that you're going to use in the majority of your clinical sites today, you can only use two. The machine that you're going to use in the majority of your clinical sites today, you can only use two. There are types of anesthesia machines that used to be made commonly uh, that you could actually add in Heliox, right? You add in helium in addition to third inner gas. Now, does helium contain any oxygen? No. Is your monitor, now does helium contain any oxygen? No. Is your monitor commonly, your gas, multi gas agent analyzer, does it commonly monitor for helium? I know. It will tell you how much oxygen is in there, but let's say you turn on 50% helium, and then let's add in another 50% uh, uh, nitrous oxide, and then he added in like 20% oxygen. You could definitely give a hypoxic mixture. And your your monitor would tell you, I'm like, hey, we're only giving 10% oxygen. It's like lighting up. I'm like, my flows are high. Just the, the wrong gas. So you need to keep that in mind. Um, I have not to this date, I, we did not try to, you have to have a special machine that's calibrated for it, has a fourth flow meter in it that you pipe the helium into. It's a big cluster. Uh, if you haven't go to a pediatric hospital, you may do that, um, as well as nitrogen, like pure nitrogen, and I'll add that into the next floor. All right? You guys recognize this? I made every group do this. All right? You're going to go for first day. It will have been some time since you were with me to do this. You should do it again. I just pushed the button. Did anything bad happen in any of the groups when I pushed that button? No. And it told you exactly what to do? Right? Because it's practice. Okay? If the computer monitor fails, that's another thing you have to remember. All right, here's the step in the low pressure system, right? All right, here's the step in the low pressure system, right? Flow meter, unidirectional valve, pressure relief device, vaporizer mounting device, fresh gas outlet. Notice one major article that we have not mentioned in this entire low, intermediate, and high pressure system. The ventilator. Where is that? Where is that? After the is it in the intermediate pressure system? No. It's in the low pressure system, right? It's connected to breathing. It has to be in the low pressure. It's the same as the bag. Okay, very good. It has to be in the low pressure. It's the same as the bag. Okay, very good. Blah, blah, blah. Um, did you guys in your reading come across the answer as to why is oxygen, the oxygen flow meter the last in the sequence? Yeah. There's, there's, a leak. there's a leak, a crack. What if you want really an interventional radiology and you're trying to help? You grab the, the non-digital anesthesia machine, the, the mighty Estiva, <coughs> and you're like sprinting sled push down the hallway, and you know there's a speed bump or like I don't know, some put a cable across of it, and you like hit it full speed. And the machine jumps like a foot in the the same thing can happen when you put it into an elevator. The, the heights are mismatched. That that jolting can cause a crack in the glass. What's, what's it called? What's the actual glass? Torque tube. Torque tube. Very good. All right. Or flow meter tube if you want to. Right. There's the flow meter series. So if you get a crack there, then you could have a hypoxia. So they, they try to guarantee the highest level of oxygen by putting the flow meter last. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
gases over the APL valve into the scavenging system. The bag should inflate and then deflate. It should suck it all out. Okay. On older anesthesia machines, the ventilator would not compensate for any of the scavenger for ventilator operation versus bagging operation. Okay. All of this stuff, like these old, like seasons, and that's this, it's like the nature of them. If I drop you into one of those machines, you're like, why is it making all this noise? So if you're squeezing the bag on an older machine, and every time you squeeze, I've never heard that noise before. Take a look down, your, your scavenger bag will probably be like this, right? And when you know what it's doing, is dumping it into the room, which is no bueno. Right? So all you gotta do is there's a knob on top increase the amount of suction to make it go yeah. flat. If you have to err on one side or the other, full suction the amount of suction to make it go yeah. flat. If you have to err on one side or the other, full suction is better than not enough suction. Okay? Fun stuff. On the Draco one, they just give you a valve there, and if the, the ball is in the middle, you know you're good. Okay? This is a nifty little thing that PhysioFlex fully, uh, a nifty little thing that PhysioFlex fully uh, self-contained, minimal flow, they call it metabolic flow anesthesia machine. It would literally drop little drops of isoforine or sevoforine into the circuit at metabolic rate. So whatever you needed, like you get the, the absolute minimum amount of absolute minimum amount of oxygen, the minimum amount of olive agent, complete circle system for like long cranies, that, that's what they would use, right? The real like math nerds that, that would get really excited for that thing. But not very common to find at all. Okay? What I wanted to say is, so what are some questions you have about ventilator, ventilator parts, its operation? The main thing we, we've learned is how to turn it off. All right? Big old green switch, or in the case of Drager, it's like a railroad, like in the, in the Wild West, when you're like, doing the same thing, right? That's how you turn it on, and we saw some of the controls, which we will go over at a later time. I'm not going to test you, you'll not be responsible for knowing that information. But turning it on, and then one thing that we talked about was that the APL valve, the little valve that we played with and left, did that have any impact on the ventilator at all? On the ventilator at all? Now, if you're 70, there's whatever, doesn't do a thing. Okay, so does the ventilator have an APL valve all to itself? It's in the machine. It is in the machine, so the answer is yes, first of all. But it's something you have to set. It is in the machine, so the answer is yes, first of all. But it's something you have to set also. So just don't, don't forget that in addition to an APL valve for the, the bag circuit, there is an APL valve on every machine that lets you set the maximum pressure that the ventilator will deliver. Right? Um, and even on the that the ventilator will deliver. Right? Um, and even on the older anesthesia machines that had a separate bellows and all that other assembly, you could do that. There's a dial that says maximum ventilator pressure. And whatever you dial it to, that was its APL valve, but it's totally separate from the APL valve that you're used to. That was its APL valve, but it's totally separate from the APL valve that you're used to uh, interfacing with. Okay, same thing with Drager. Okay, that's really like a major takeaway. Like I want you to know that the APL valve that you see there is only for the bag assembly. It is not for the ventilator assembly. Okay? The bag assembly is not for the ventilator assembly. Okay? Gross. Uh, yeah, anytime you have like sticky valves or anything like that, I'll show you how to change them on our old machine here. But if, it, if it's really that, if you have to take a toothbrush and start, but if, it, if it's really that, if you have to take a toothbrush and start scrubbing the gunk off of one of the expiratory valves in order to fully seat, it is probably at that time uh, necessary for you to go ahead and call BioMed and say, I think we need a full machine inspection and wipe down on this thing and switch it out for another machine. After mass casualty, and that's all that was left, then okay, we will MacGyver it. Um, I went to Ecuador once and there was a hole in the bellows case assembly that I had to patch with a piece of extra gum that I had chewed for about 30 minutes, a phenylephrine cap, and a piece of duct tape. do that in the United States, send it to Biomed, or cancel the case. Okay? 
Questions? Are there any, anything come across in the reads? Like something that just wasn't clear to you? Like, let's have the discussion now. It's much easier to do it now than when I'm three time zones away. And it's the day before the exam. Yes? Um, when you lose pressure, you have to go to the cylinder. Mm -hmm. And then, can you just explain that again? I, sure. That was just too fast for me. Right, so in, in our lab, we, I, did anybody in the lab not do this? I'm pretty sure we did it in every, every one of them. But we simulated a pipeline pressure one of them. But we simulated a pipeline pressure failure by deliberately unplugging the green um, pipeline hose from the wall. All right, we made a big loud sound. There's the Joe Trump going. Okay. Okay, and then we had, we had to have the flows on the, the machine on. If the machine was not in the opposite, we had to have the flows on the, the machine on. If the machine was not in the opposition, if an oxygen flow was not happening. Nothing would really happen other than the alarm would say, I think we disconnected. Okay. But in its default configuration, there's no real visual indicator to say anything's wrong unless you're you're giving an anesthetic. So let's say you're doing it like four meters a minute, you turn the O2 to four meters, and all right, three, two, one, failure. Pull it off. Okay, so all, the only oxygen that's in the hose was the pressure contained in the hose, past the downstage regulator, into the machine past the digital flow meter, needle valve, and all that other stuff in the ESIS I was talking about. And then as the pressure goes around 12 PSI, roughly, the machine digitally, in our case, went da 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 we got the red flashies that says, you know, O2 supply failure. No. Um, and then we rest already into the yoke, the yoke block, Right, and we cracked it open. Do we do, we do clockwise or counterclockwise? Open. Counterclockwise, counter right? Lefty loosey, right? And does it need to be like <sighs> quick? No, it just needs a quarter turn. You'll hear it crack, like it's like that. Okay, we're good because we now have oxygen supply. Okay, so we still need to fix the pipeline, but now we're we're okay for now. Okay. Uh, if for some reason you're running really high flows, like 10 or 12 meters, I don't know why you're doing that, but let's pretend you are. If you go to the cylinder, yes, you only have how many liters in a full oxygen cylinder? That's an E cylinder. You only have how many liters in a full oxygen cylinder? That's an E cylinder. 660. Not 2,000. 660. 600, 660, somewhere in that vicinity, right? So at 10 liters a minute, you'd have an hour. Okay? So. Lower your flows, conserve your supply while you figure out. Then you call for help, say what's going on. Lower your flows, conserve your supply while you figure out. Then you call for help, say what's going on. Like, and then when we said, all right, we fix the problem. Okay, so what we did in the check is we turned the cylinder off and purposely made the alarm go back on. Now, in a case, you would not do that, of course. But for your check, we purposely bled down. And that's what that's doing is that's taking everything that's feeding from the high pressure system through the yoke block, the downstage regulator, right? That's all feeding into the other side of the intermediate pressure system and going through the machine. Once we close that supply off, it's the same thing that happened when we disconnected from the pipeline is now gonna to happen to the high pressure system clockwise to close the cylinder. And then everything that was contained in the machine, which was at 2,000 PSI through that little yoke block, and then the downstage regulator pulls it down from 2,000 to about what? 50, right? 47, 50, 55, anywhere in that range is okay. Right? So everything from should flow forward until the pressure falls to about 12 PSI, roughly. The flow will diminish because there's no pressure to drive forward anymore. And then that oxygen failure alarm would go back on again. And what do we do? Now that's it's closed, can't go anywhere, anywhere else. And we rescue. Again, we push the pipeline back in and our cylinder pressure gauge prop the pipeline back in and our cylinder pressure gauge properly reads zero. This is what we want after we've checked. Does that make sense? All right, so here we'll review the steps. Pipeline disconnect, alarm on, cylinder rescue, alarm off. Turn the cylinder off, again, right, restrict it. Alarm off. Turn the cylinder off, again, right, restrict it. Choke it, All right? Alarm turns back on again. Rescue. And then it goes off again. Okay, good test. You should. You should. You should. All right. Other questions? Comments?
concepts, like anything that was just like no, not kind of, not yet. Yes. Uh, I don't know if I was reading it correctly, but I was reading something to the effect where if you if you're not simulating that test, if it's really happening where you oxygen failure. Yeah. Or Pretend J E really does dig through. Okay. It, it fits. Like the stuff's still plugged in, and you're getting the alarm. Like, oh, right. That I was one. reading. I think that. If it's low, it still has priority over your E cylinder, even if it's turned off. Like if you have a fault in your pipe, turn to your, is that right? No, it's not that, so if you're, I don't if, know. If, if JEA digs through, right, there is a possibility that the check valve that exists between both sides, remember after the cylinder and the yoke block and the downstage regulator, there's a little piece of pipe that's now intermediate pressure. So there's a valve, as it were, that should prevent any gases coming from the cylinder going backwards out the pipeline. Okay? But if you were to disconnect the pipeline, there's a valve in that assembly that's a secondary backup to make sure that gases from your pipeline don't go backwards and away from the patient. It continues to go forward. The gases from your pipeline don't go backwards and away from the patient. It continues to go forward. And there's no way for you to test that valve. But if you left it in to the pipe, all those, that safety valve is open because it needs to go in. It needs to go through that entire assembly on the, the pipeline side. So we disconnect something on the, the pipeline side. So we disconnect to make sure that stays closed on the hose side, just drop it on the ground. And that way when you open the pipeline, pipeline gases only will go forward and they'll go right past that little Y connection and go straight forward to the patient. So that my connection, and goes straight forward to the patient. So that that's why they say to disconnect it. Because if you had it open, I mean, if, if it's plugged into the wall, gases should go freely, usually in one direction. But it's not a valve that prevents it from going backward. It's forward pressure that drives it forward. Okay. What else? Drives it forward. Okay. What else? You and you. Uh, so this was not covered in any of the readings, but like I was uh, online looking for some uh, equipment, anesthesia equipment questions. Yes, okay. And during these questions, they talked about a partial rebreathing system versus a full rebreathing system. They talked about a partial rebreathing system versus a full rebreathing system. Oh, yes. I don't know what that means. All right. Well, I will not ask you any questions about partial right. rebreathing and, right. and full rebreathing. I'll explain what it is. Okay, so. When we do, and when you guys come rotate through me, and if we get the right type of case, we're going to do a closed circuit, total rebreathing type scenario. And we will do crazy stuff. And you're like, I've never seen anybody do this before, but it seems dangerous, but it's not. It's totally fine. Okay? And the idea of a totally closed rebreathing circuit is that you only give enough gas, like oxygen, and volatile agent, like the patient requires. And this is all in a low flow primer. Right, which you have not read because you told you not to eat. Um, so the idea is in a closed circuit, you only add in what is used. Right? Even the little sampling line that's sucking gases out, we get crazy and we take what was used, so the couple atoms that it used to figure out what's going on inside the circuit, then we return the leftover atoms back in. Okay? Then after that, that's closed. In a partial open system, the, the fresh gas flows are higher. So the next level up from totally closed circuit is semi-closed. Totally closed circuit is semi-closed. So yeah, it goes closed, semi-closed, semi-open, open. And in a semi-closed circuit, it's the exact same thing, except our flows exceed what the patients need, right? And we have the APL valve typically in the middle closed position, like 30 centimeters of water. And our patient the middle closed position, like 30 centimeters of water and their patient could be spontaneously breathing when the ventilator could be set okay, with a Pmax value of 30, where you turn the dial down to 30, and you never exceed you know, 30-ish, but maybe sometimes you might exceed 30, in which case there might be some bleed out over that. And then the semi-open 30, in which case there might be some bleed out over that. And then the semi-open system, you set the EPL valve wide open, right? And you're giving four liters a minute or so, Right? And then you, occasionally you may clamp it down so that you're rebreathing some, but most of it is kind of going out the way of the APL valve and in the scavenger. And the fully open style, right? Go ahead and lay down. I'm going to take this metal mask and I'm going to put some cloth on it. 
and you just keep breathing, and I'm going to force an ether on you. That's an open system, right? There's no scavenging. There's no. There's no nothing. Okay. Make that aside. So, the, even though he says he's pro dope, but, he died. but they were talking about in the article with the low flows. That was minimal, right. low flow, or the minimal, flows low? Min minimal, minimal flow, flow. Mm -hmm. and why they had to lower the minimal flow below metabolic requirements for a period of time until it dropped too low and hit it. Bump it up a little bit. Bump it up a little bit. Right? It's for when you're bored and a tenant have you know lots of fun with minimal math. Okay, that is your question. Your question is next. Um, Justin Miller, it was just slightly confusing to me because of something you said when we went to the lab. So, um, oxygen flush valve, all the safety feature, delivery of the 100% high flow through the circuit, which bypasses the vaporizers, delivery of the 100% high flow through the circuit, which bypasses the vaporizers, and then it says uses for uh, uses are for jet ventilation. And I thought you specifically mm -hmm. said. You can do this all you want, but... You can, depending on the machine. There are a few machines that the, tra the jet ventilator will work. Depending on the machine, there are a few machines that the, tra the jet ventilator will work through that. And they have a specific setting, like, a, like you, you can flip a switch and go to it's called the, the alternative common gas outlet. So if you were to plug the circuit into that, it might, it would work, if it's specified. Most machines will will not operate a transdermal jet ventilator in a bind. If you had no other option, right, you could at least get the E for effort for taking a 14 gauge IV catheter, right, sticking it through the cricothyroid membrane. Uh, they need, I think it's a it's a three cc syringe, a 702 with your hand, than you will with the um, the flush valve. But the problem with the transtracheal jet ventilation, the whole concept is not about high pressure. It's about intermediate pressure and extremely high flows. And using the Venturi effect, it pulls oxygen into the distal lung passageways. It's not because you're forcing a couple extra minutes. That's the only conceivable way I can, like when you say jet ventilation, I, that's the only thing I can do. But I mean, I'll, I'll verify for you. If you just stick the flush valve in, if nothing's gonna happen, it won't work. They, they test, they, it's in one of the servers. Like, can we use this? And they say, yeah, I use it a lot. And it's, a, and that, it's a common question. Like, if a sales guy comes in, you ask him, and he or she will probably, oh, yeah. Show me. Prove it to me where in the manual it says, this is how you do it. And if it says that in the manual, then I will believe that that particular model on that machine will do it in a bottom. But I guarantee you that that particular model on that machine will do it in a bottom. But I guarantee you it's very, very different. Then the traditional uh, transtrick of jet ventilator setup, you know what it looks like? It's a big, it's a hose that's supposed to go to the back of the machine that's connected to this, uh, the same thing that the tire pressure guys use to fill the air in your tires. Same thing. When you did it, used to fill the air in your tires. Same thing. When you did it, and you plug that directly into the wall, 55 PSI. Right? And it's got a little gauge on it. And you stick it on to the, the, the jet ventilator tube that goes through the cracked thyroid membrane, and you hold that, that handle down until the gauge goes to 50, go. Okay. That's my best answer. So he's right, depending on model. Majority of them, though, I've yet to encounter one that explicitly says that. You had another question? Yeah. Um, on the and there were a bunch of acronyms. Um, so how much of that do you expect us to know? Yeah, yeah, don't memorize acronyms. Memorize, there's lots of them, right? They, yeah. they change. Uh, the OFPD, the Oxygen Failure Protection Device, the ORSM, that's one specific for Drager, the that's Oxygen awesome. Ratio Monitor Controller. I'll do this to you. Where I say, what is the function of the blah, blah, this like five acronym, you know, letter acronym, and then not tell you what it is. So don't. Memorize what the concept is. Okay? Does that help answer your question? Yeah. Like you have a specific one that you want to know, like, uh, like, I hope he doesn't ask me this one. <laughs> like, I hope he doesn't ask me this one. <laughs> uh, for example, like, I'm just trying to think what SA type button you might pass on. Like, <laughs> you know, I often ask myself, what <laughs> 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 you know, like, um, <laughs> say you were to ask something like that, are we expected to, like, no. regurgitate all these types of like that. Are we expected to like no. regurgitate all these types of? Okay. 
Okay. Essay questions are for you being able to articulate the concept. Okay. Right. And I, if you're in the vein, if you're close, you're on the right track. I'm like, okay, you get. It. And I really, I'm looking for. They are on. I don't know. They're on another planet. <laughs> right. Looking for. They are on. I don't know. They're on another planet. <laughs> right. They got close, or they're right on. Basically. Okay. Another question. So vaporization lecture, I have a comment that for my notes it says if two percent dial is one mag, two mag is two. Appreciate the question. So I'll help clarify. Yeah. So we talked for a little bit also about um, your I hope you're learning in your pharma your anesthesia pharmacology classes, right? For volatile agents. Do you have the lecture yet? No. So <laughs> So take up all the mag questions. <laughs> for ISO four. Right, not monitored in anesthesia care, a MAC of isoforin is around 1 to 1.2 percent, depending on age or the book you read or who knows what, right? A MAC of sevoforin is around 2 ish percent, and a MAC of desforane is 6 percent, roughly, for a 40 year old. One MAC, the definition of a MAC of volatile agent, is equal to the concentration of a given any of the volatile agents needed to suppress the movement of a human being, 40 year old, healthy adult, 70 kilograms, whatever, on surgical stimulation. What is surgical stimulation? Grams, whatever. On surgical stimulation. What is surgical stimulation? It's defined by 45 pounds of pressure against the tibial plateau. Um, what's the other one that they use? Surgical incision, right? So they do this, 50% of them will not move. There's another MAC value. Right? 50% of them will not move. There's another MAC value, right? MAC bar, block adrenergic response, which usually covers about 95% of everybody else. So if you think of a MAC of anesthesia as a full dose of anesthesia for most people, and by the full dose of anesthesia for most people, and by most, I mean half. That's one, two, and six percent of ISO, SIBO, and DES. Does that make sense? Right. So, like, for pro you guys know what the dose for propofol is to put someone to sleep? Uh, ten, ten, you know what the dose for propofol is to put someone to sleep? Uh, ten, 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 two to two point five milligrams. Right. Mm -hmm. What's the dose of isoforin to put someone to sleep? It's one percent ish. Sevoforin, two percent ish. 6%, except it's not an IV bullet work. Again, low flow primer, we'll talk about like why. 6%, except it's not an IV bullet work. Again, low flow primer, we'll talk about like why you have to do it for 20 minutes before someone stops moving. Okay? So, the MAC of a volatile agent is different than, you know, when we say look at the dial and turn it to one, like let's use isoforin because it's easy. Isoforin is 1% for under normal circumstances. And that should keep someone asleep. But if I just put you to sleep and I turn it to one and walk away, will you stay asleep? In 30 minutes, probably, you'll probably be asleep. So we have to make some adjustments, both in flow rate and in the actual foreign rate pressure goes from one all the way up to five percent. That's five full doses of volatile agent continuously when it's getting one, right? Now the MAC of the volatile agent necessary to use uh, suppress movement is called, it's 1%, but 1% of what? 1%. Now we have to do some math. Thanks for this question. Do we need to know how to do this math? All right. I'll try to walk on this side, so line of sight is good. So we talked in some of the labs, not all of it, but if you were to dial in, here's your ISO 4. I wish we had purple. Okay. Here's an ISO 4. Here's an ISO 4. I'm using isoporin because the math is easy on this, okay? We said that a MAC of isoporin is what percent? One So, yeah. if I have one percent of isoporin, this is called volumes percent. Volumes percent. I say it that way because that means that for whatever volume you're running through the vaporizer, 1.1 percent of it on the, out, on the other side of it, on the outflow of that vaporizer, when it rejoins on the variable bypass trap, when it rejoins on the variable bypass trap, 
will be isoformic. So let's do this easy. What if we're giving, uh, if you have one liter, one liter flows per minute, right? right? One liter per minute, isn't that the same as one thousand, right? Thank you, metric system. Milliliters per minute, okay? You're going to see why we're doing this here in a second. So if I turn my dial at 1% and I'm running 1,000 milliliters per minute through that, you're used to thinking of things like in doses of like volume, right? But this is not liquid volume, this is vaporized volume, right? So through the vaporizer, when I turn it at 1,000, and if I set the dial to 1%, then 10 milliliters of isoforin will come out on the other side of it in one minute. For the first 10 minutes, is this enough to keep someone asleep? Even though I said, by definition, that's the amount, but you need to have enough you know, drinks in the body to be able to keep them in a sedated state. Right, it's like a loading dose, and so the, the it's state. Right, it's like a loading dose, and so the, the, the reason why I give you a low flow primer for later reading is so you can understand, oh, that's why you have to have four liter flows. So if I turn this from one liter, to 4,000 milliliters per minute, how many milliliters are on this side? 4,000 milliliters per minute, how many milliliters are on this side? 4,000 And I said, how many milliliters every minute can the body absorb by some point? 400. 400. Okay, so now you're beginning to see the only choice I have is to go from 1 to 5%. And now I'm moving somewhere. Because if it's at 5%, I'm moving somewhere. Because if it's at 5%, how many milliliters are now going in at 4 liters? Now I'm getting close, right? So I said the body can uptake 400. I, so my only way to get 400 is what? Milliliters per minute. And finally, right? And you get 400. And then you know what happens in about 15 minutes? Vaporizer's dry. <laughs> okay? Yeah, and, and, we'll, and we'll go over this later, but the volumes, this is what volumes per sentence. It says you drink 5% in 8 liters, in about 5 minutes, your patient's blood pressure will be about 30 over 20. Okay? The amount of myocardial depression at such a high level, right, a volume percent of a, any volume, you can, the same thing with sebaporin, the number is not 5, it's 8. The same thing with desperate, except it's 18. Right? You do that. Just like slam it full on, like max dose. Oh, they won't move all right. They'll be very still. Dead still. <laughs> After about five to ten, I mean, that doesn't happen. We used to have like an anesthesia simulator where you could like give massive doses of propofol. In our contest, we see who could kill the baby there, where you could like give massive doses of propofol. In our contest, we see who could kill the baby, the digital patients we could see, right? without using muscle relaxants or potassium. Um, and you know, so this gives you the idea. This is volumes per sentence. This is why you have the variable bypass, like what comes out the other end is the amount of vaporized volatile agent. What comes out the other end is the amount of vaporized volatile agent. And that is what continues on through the common gas outlet, in through the inspiratory limb, to the endotracheal tube, or LMA, in and out, circle, 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 right? You can imagine that the idea is to provide as many molecules of isoforine at the alveoli as possible and keep the cardiac output high so that I can move stuff around and eventually it lands in the brain and then I can back up, right, with my flow and this as well as my volume This is like the one breath induction. Maybe. <laughs> it, can, it is, has been demonstrated before with single point, single breath induction. Uh, that would be eager video. Yes. They, they, Which, by the way, he passed away. Did you guys yeah, yeah. yeah. Does that help answer your question? Yeah. yeah. That, was, that, that stuff, yeah. when I was in your position, was so tough for me to like wrap my head around. And I promise you, I really didn't fully understand it until about like five years ago. I come up with like different ways to help you guys you know, understand it a little bit better. So, all right. Yes. One last question. Miller, I, that's um, a lot. <laughs> Today, okay. uh, Miller has a lot of hollow thing. Um, Skip. Okay. Only you. concentrate on stuff we're allowed to use in the United States. I heard 
a rumor from one of the reps. I heard a rumor from one of the reps that I work with though that St. Vincent's has stuff that's so old to actually have Halloween still. So. In somewhere. This is That's how dangerous is some scary shit. Its blood gap partition coefficient is, is so high. Its blood gap partition coefficient is, is so high. It's like um, steering a cruise ship and putting the brakes on a little too late. You crash into the, you know, the port. Can't stop. Does it cause such myocardial depression? And it's toxic to the myocardium. Such myocardial depression. And it's toxic to the myocardium. If you go too far, the only thing that rescues you is cardiac output is CPR. Yeah, just like you know, bupivacaine toxic dose. No bueno. Alright, we have one more. There was somebody else that raised me. No bueno. All right, we have one more. There was somebody else that raised it. Yes. Do we need to know anything about uh, CO2 absorbance? Yes. Yeah. I told you I would not ask you the formula or the moles of carbon dioxide that are produced by each mole of, yeah, I won't do that. You should know each mole of, yeah, I won't do that. You should know, you need to know the important things like carbon monoxide, even though compound A has been shown really to only be risky in rats, you need to know that that is a factor. You know, what are the conditions that can, if that can increase the risk for the production of bad stuff? If that can increase the risk for the production of bad stuff happening in the using the And I said, I told you, and I, I promise you, I will not ask you minimal flow, low flow fiber questions. It's there for your, I want you to have it, but don't spend hours, or if you need to divert because you're so bored of uh, the rest of the stuff, try that. Okay? Otherwise, what did I say? My, my job is to teach you here in lecture, give you good materials, and then when I give you an exam, I gotta be truthful cool to what I said I would do, which is to stick to the sources that I, that means I can't ask you crazy questions from the dear sirs, right? I'm, I'm telling you that all of the questions will come from the readings in Miller. Okay. Okay. That thing. Yes. So when it when it says corresponding chapters in Dorsch, just don't. I, I, because I don't mandate that you have to use Miller. So if I were you, I'd use Miller. <laughs> if you like Dorsch better, go ahead. It's certainly a good adjunct. But if you if you have to choose one, I I go with Miller. I think it's a better a better time. Yes. Um, can you um, explain one more time the difference between the APL valve in the and um, explain one more time the difference between the APL valve in the and the system machine and the ventilator? Yes, yes. Okay, so the APL valve in our lab on the ACES machine with that big green knob, we spun it from zero all the way up to seventy, and you noticed that when you got past thirty, it had like kind of like this this ratchety feeling. That's a good way to describe it. Okay, that's the APL valve. That is this. This ratchety feeling, that's a good way to describe it, okay? That's the APL valve that is only connected to your circuit with the, the breathing bag, right? The, the rubber uh, ambu bag that you have on your arm. It has absolutely nothing to do with the ventilator. The ventilator also has its own APL valve. APL valve. In the case of the ACES, you did not do ventilator settings in this particular part, so don't want to show up the ventilator. It had, there's a digital setting in the machine for the APL, it's called the P-MAX, like uppercase P, lowercase M-A-X. We will go over that in a ventilator mode and completely different devices and the way that you control them. They perform the same function, but they are controlled by two different implements, okay? So, in other words, that's how so that Pressure for the airway. Yeah, if you're on the ventilator, right? And we talked about when you go to the ventilator, what are you supposed to do? Okay. Now on the on the ventilator, if you're cooling around, the P max value can go up and down. Whatever you set it at, if you set it to 20, let's say you give a thousand cc high wide, which will clearly exceed 20, you will alarm, and everything over 20 will spill. You will not deliver that that pressure. Show me that picture because I did not remember. So that back. also there's a pressure control the scavenging system because you have like you exceeding that pressure and then it goes to the scavenging system. Yeah, yeah. That, and so, that's what happens. So when you spill half, whatever you set, your APL valve or the PMAX valve, 
right? Which is even though it's digitally yeah. controlled, there's a physical valve controlling that on top of the machine, the top of the hospital, not 55 gallon barrels and shipped off to Nevada. Okay. Thank you. Recycle. All right. Any other questions? All right. Begin your hurricane preparedness now. If, if for some reason it's catastrophic, do you think that this will be up before our exam next week?